Pop quiz. What's the very first thing that comes to mind when you think about the Japanese game developer from software? The odds are pretty good that your mind's eye has conjured up the scene from the Soul series. Or Bloodborne. Or Sekiro. You know, or maybe you're one of those insufferable old-timers who's always banging on about their retro cred, so you're thinking about their classic franchises on the PS1, like the dark fantasy epic Kingsfield. Deep stealth them up, Tenshu. Or the mecha action RPG Armored Core. Or perhaps you just really, really love Metal Wolf Chaos. Okay, let's party! Welcome to the White House. As any FromSoft aficionado will be all too eager to tell you, these very different series all have quite a bit in common. The company has made a name for themselves as a developer of games that boast deep mechanical complexity, well fleshed out settings, and compulsively compelling gameplay loops. We're presently living within a golden age of From Software, with the studio's output now universally recognized as a new standard of excellence in game design. Dark Souls has been named Game of the Decade numerous times, and even if you don't think it's the best individual game that came out in the 2010s, it is hard to overstate its enormous, lasting influence it had on video game design. Not just in terms of action-adventure RPG, but also when it comes to narrative design. And with the upcoming release of the Jar Jar Martin-approved Elden Ring, it's an ideal time to travel way back to From Software's origins. There is one title in particular I have in mind that never quite seems to get its due, and that has always been an underrated, underappreciated black sheep of the FromSoft flock. Which is ironic, because it is such a perfect example of the enchanting marriage of meaningful gameplay and a storytelling philosophy that respects the player's intellect that has made the studio so famous. In its own way, this forgotten PS1 gem from 1998 defines from software as much as anything they released pre-Demon Souls. So today, let's go on a spectral excursion in pursuit of a legendary lost classic, Echo Knight. From Software is famous for a narrative style that encourages the player to act as an archaeologist, excavating a game's story and lore by piecing together the tale from fragments discovered through exploration and keen observation. So it's only appropriate that we assume the role of amateur excavator as we dig into the history of the company itself and how Echo Knight came to be. By the late 1990s, FromSoft had successfully transitioned away from business productivity software following the crushing economic depression of Japan's last decade of the 1990s. After witnessing the dazzling demonstration of the classic CRPG wizardry on the Apple II, the owners of FromSoft were all in on video games as the new bleeding edge frontier of computing. They had released several critically acclaimed games that sold quite respectably both in Japan and the US. By that time, they had earned enough notoriety and hype to ensure that, going forward, most of their major releases would be localized for the West. But in this moment, rather than take the safe route and pump out another Armored Core or Kingsfield sequel, they made an entirely different gamble. With Echo Knight, they threw caution to the wind, abandoned the notion that mere iteration is the end-all be-all, and fully embraced the continuing evolution of their signature style. Where Armored Core was lightning fast and relentless, Echo Knight would demand a slow, methodical approach from the player. And where King's Field was a relatively straightforward dungeon crawler with a plot to match, this game would unfold loosely and non-linearly, requiring players to think laterally to solve puzzles and even demanding more than one playthrough to fully piece its narrative together. And even with this new approach, Echo Knight is still unmistakably a FromSoft title. 
The game takes the studio's legendary design principles and applies them to a unique and original mix of the puzzle adventure and survival horror genres. And the result is unlike anything you've played before. The story begins in media's res, with our unlikely protagonist Richard Osmond getting a phone call from the local police. His father's house has burned down and his whereabouts are currently unknown. Richard visits the charred remains of his father's estate, and after digging amongst the ruins and finding a hidden mechanism in the surprisingly unscathed grandfather's clock, he unearths a battered journal. And as soon as he opens its pages, Richard triggers a supernatural memento and is transported into the past to view events from the perspective of his paterfamilias. Within the first 10 minutes of starting the game, the player suddenly finds themselves immersed in a tense encounter on a moving train, culminating in a pistols-drawn standoff with the villainous William Rockwell. It is something of a breakneck opener for what is otherwise a fairly slow-paced and thoughtful adventure experience. The player is indeed thrown right into the thick of it. But nervous newbies need not worry, because just like every other FromSoft game, the opening level does a superb job of drip-feeding you its mechanics to bring you up to speed. You don't even have to be familiar with classic point-and-click adventure games like Mist or Monkey Island to wrap your head around Echo Knight in no time. While navigating the environment in first person, you explore and inspect your surroundings by manipulating objects with a contextual cursor. Moving the cursor over interactive objects or areas of interest allows the player to investigate their surroundings, pick up and inspect items, interact with puzzles, or speak to NPCs. But just as the player begins to grasp the mechanics, they're hit with one hell of a plot twist. Richard's father, Harry, was a legendary demon hunter, and Richard is now being thrust into a high-stakes, globe-trotting adventure in search of a set of mysterious red and blue stones. These gems are demonic artifacts of immense power, capable of possessing those who wield them and even bending the fabric of reality itself. The time-traveling mechanic introduced in the tutorial takes center stage as the rest of the game unfolds of its four to six hour playtime. Oftentimes, interacting with the environment will suddenly transport the player to the past, but they must then speak with spectral apparitions, listen to their tragic backstories, and acquire the items and clues needed to bring them closure and progress the story. But Echo Knight distinguishes itself from similar adventure games and forges its own identity thanks to the clever ways it incorporates light survival horror mechanics into the experience. And the word light is definitely a double entendre here, because a considerable chunk of the game involves activating sources of illumination to ward off sinister and spooky ghosts in order to secure the environment and begin solving the actual puzzles. It's the light. They're not fond of light. As befits an early survival horror title, Richard is fragile and cannot withstand too many attacks from the numerous hostile ghosts he encounters. So rather than assault his foes head-on, the player must figure out how to best keep them at bay, repel them, or outsmart them entirely. But watch out, because you're going to witness some amazing, really high-quality jump scares along the way. You know, jump scares that are actually, you know, add something to the story, which is not the case for most jump scares. Not a big fan in general, only if it's done right. And in the process, you'll come face to face with the most frightening and fearsome nemesis of all. A giggling ghost girl. <laughs> Seriously, never underestimate giggling ghost girls in video games. Just as Dark Souls is an unabashedly Japanese take on Western high fantasy, Echo Knight also proudly wears its influences and inspirations on its sleeve. The game takes a grab-bag approach to design and genre, fusing elements of Western adventure games, point-and-click puzzle games, and Japanese survival horror into a unique synthesis. The most obvious point of comparison is probably the original Resident Evil, which came out about two years before Echo Knight. But for as much as Echo Knight is undoubtedly inspired by the masterpiece that literally coined the term survival horror, it leans much more heavily on elements of a game that came out almost a decade before that. The never released outside of Japan 1989 Famicom classic Sweet Home. Sweet Home is, by every measure, the original survival horror game from long before the genre was even a twinkle in Shinji Mikami's eye. 
In it, you control a documentary film team as a set of JRPG-style party of characters to explore an abandoned, cursed estate. By using each character's unique inventory and skills in concert with the others, the party battles ghosts and demons, solves puzzles, and investigates their way through a grisly mansion murder mystery. Sweet Home was not a massively popular million-selling title. It was never officially translated or localized, and it received middling reviews in the country's domestic press, earning only a 28 out of 40 from the magazine Famitsu. But like a true cult classic, the haunted hallways of Sweet Home have lingered in the corridors of our imaginations. Its deft and genre-defying fusion of adventure, puzzle, and RPG elements have led many critics to declare it one of the best and most influential horror games ever made, and it is officially listed as one of the key inspirations that led Shinji Mikami to create the original Resident Evil. Sweet Home is also an early example of what we would now call a Metroidvania, released well before either series had graduated from the NES. These days, it is rightfully regarded as a milestone in the evolution of gaming generally, and horror games specifically. And the parallels between Sweet Home and Echo Knight are immediately obvious. With its emphasis on puzzle solving, over combat encounters, and slow methodical exploration over fast-paced action sequences, it's rooted in the same design values that made Sweet Home such a legendary horror cult classic. One of my personal favorite parts about Echo Knight is that you can find all of the now tried and true FromSoft storytelling flourishes in its early stages, raw and uncut. You don't have to be scared. I just possess an alien power. I am able to see the world through the book as it travels around the world. Yes, the entire world. <laughs> It features mysterious and shadowy characters, poignant yet utterly confusing dialogue, an asynchronous, non-linear narrative relayed heavily via flashbacks, and a storytelling style that demands the active participation of the player as Gumshoe. FromSoft's penchant for grand scripted events is evident in Echo Knight as well. As Richard follows in the footsteps of Papa Harry, hot on the trail of the Redstone, the player will enjoy some set pieces that have a genuinely thrilling and theatrical quality to them. You'll take a first tentative steps onto the haunted ship Orpheus, where ghosts wail in the wind. You'll take a truly creepy and unnerving ride on a haunted merry-go-round, with horror potentially lurking around each turn of the carousel. To play roulette and poker with the ghostly denizens of a haunted casino aboard the Orpheus. Now, you might be noticing that Echo Knight has some similarities to another Japanese classic horror game that I covered on my channel recently, Fatal Frame. And you know what, that's such an astute observation, an excellent point of comparison if I might say so. In fact, I'd say it's totally fair to argue that, as Daniel Curland of BloodyDisgusting.com put it, the Echo Knight games were Fatal Frame before Fatal Frame. Link to the articles in the description, you should give it a read. Because just like in Fatal Frame, Echo Knight demands the player to take up the role of amateur archaeologist and become an active participant in the narrative in order to solve puzzles and survive the horrors. Much of Echo Knight's story is likewise told through ghostly flashbacks and time-traveling trips into the past. Events are relayed to the player asynchronously and never in exact chronological order, which is part of the overarching puzzle. We often witness events without the critical context that might reveal their full meaning. It is ultimately left up to you to piece together the fragmented sequence of events, further immersing the player in the narrative and making the story inseparable from the person playing it. And at the risk of having to put yet another coin in the Dark Souls reference jar, you might even say that... The flow of time itself is convoluted, with heroes centuries old phasing in and out. The very fabric wavers, and relations shift and obscure. Unfortunately, like most ghost stories, this game's tale doesn't exactly have a happy ending. Despite everything it managed to achieve on the humble hardware of the PlayStation 1, to this day, Echo Knight remains a relatively unknown game. It's only in recent years that it has begun to be recognized as an overlooked cult classic. 
but due to its mixed reception upon release and little in the way of marketing, Echo Knight only saw modest sales numbers across Japan, Europe and the US. The game performed poorly enough that FromSoft was discouraged from localizing the 1999 sequel, Lord of Nightmares, which remained a Japan-exclusive PS1 release. Weirdly enough, the third and final game in the series, Echo Knight Beyond, was localized in the US and Europe this time around. But the response was mixed, and reviewers were generally unimpressed by the trilogy's PS2 outing. The game sold poorly, and the franchise was quietly shelved, where it remains to this day a deep cut languishing in From Software's back catalogue. As of this moment, the only way to play the original Echo Knight is on the PlayStation 3 or Sony Vita, as part of the PlayStation Network's line of PS Classics titles. Otherwise, your choices for experiencing this lost classic are either emulation or eBay, where a physical copy of the game will run you at least 75 US dollars. Echo Knight may never be fully recognized as a cult classic masterpiece, but its design DNA echoes through so many of the FromSoft games that came after it. Pun intended. And I believe it's not a stretch to claim that its reverberations can still be felt in the iconic style of storytelling that makes the Soulsborne games so spectacular and memorable. So if you want me to be corny, and you know I always want to be, you could say that as we draw back the curtains of time and peer through the mists of the years, from software, will forever be haunted by the ghost of Echo Knight. <clears throat> oh, hey, I didn't see you there. Um, I hope I could pique your interest a little bit for Echo Knight, maybe get you to play it, because it's really one of my absolute favorite FromSoft classics from long before the company's golden era. I think you could tell that I have a very squishy, soft spot for this game. And hey, in fact, it's not even their only noteworthy forgotten horror gem now, is it? I bet a lot of you thought that this video might be about Kion, and it was a close call when I decided which of the old FromSoft horror jewels I want to cover for this video, but hey, if you're interested for me to dig a little deeper into FromSoft's backlog and would like me to cover Kion in a future video, let me know. And if you'd like to support me with my work on my channel, then I'd ask you kindly to check out my Patreon and consider pitching in with a monthly donation within your comfort levels, because crowdfunding is the bread and butter of this channel. So thank you for watching, my deep gratitude to everyone who supports me on Patreon already, and a special mention this time goes out to Chrissy, Laird Wackala, Agustin Ortega, Arnie, Max Macula, Matt Gretton, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Chuck Taylor, Lawrence E. Buben, Malin, Andrew Hines, Pablo Arcelis, Swallowtail Knights, Nobad Gerard Matinka, Evan Tickre, Casper Rahm, Billy Lott, Christine, Chris Jam, Ty McCandless, Terry Collins, Dennis Pfeffercon, Kevin H. Yang, Kenan Ward, aka Legolas Katarn, Wobbles and Bean the Wonder Ducks, Dimitas Slatkov, Joey Monster, Gay Hennas, Sven Bischoff, Jin Hansen, Sophie Palson, Nathan O'Connor, Jordan, Thwagam, Gantan Podom, Faulty Gear, Adriel Garcia, Ronin Krom, and Mura Casardis. Until next time, ta ta!